augmenting textbooks with relevant web content. So the way we uh, do this is we first identify, given your textbook, we, we identify sections that are not written well and uh, which can potentially benefit from such augmentation. And once we identify such sections, we, we uh, augment with uh, relevant uh, web content as well as images. <coughs> So for example, if uh, suppose that this is a section that we have identified as uh, not easy to understand, and then we might, uh, once we identify the concepts discussed in this section, we, we, we could uh, potentially provide like pointers to say uh, relevant <coughs> Wikipedia articles or the images uh, relevant to the content of this section. Do you view this as an online textbook instead of a hard copy textbook? Uh, so there are many, I, th I think that's a great question. So the, the, the question is about, if we have something like this, how do we deploy this, right? So, so one model is, of course, if the textbooks are available online, then uh, it becomes very easy. So you can have uh, point, uh, pointers like, you, you can even augment the PDFs with the links to pointers and so forth. Uh, there are other uh, possible mechanisms. Uh, uh, one. One possibility is that uh, the ebook readers are becoming cheaper and cheaper, and, and so there are there have been efforts to uh, distribute such ebooks in uh, places in Africa and so forth. So, so that could be another uh, mode of uh, deployment. Or even uh, so, there has been a very interesting uh, piece of uh, research in uh, from the MSR India lab where uh, they have showed that you can take off-the-shelf DVD players and with the DVD remotes and encode uh, a significant chunk of Wikipedia on that. So the idea is that the, uh, you can use the navigation provided by the remotes to uh, just navigate, uh, go, um, uh, go in, into links and so forth, navigate the, the entire Wikipedia. So there, there, can, there are may, many possible um, mechanisms like this. Of course, the, the last resort is uh, it, 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 this can be supplemented materials to uh, paper textbooks, but uh, uh, printed textbooks, but I think the, the, that's not that, that's the that's n n uh, that's the least likely scenario of uh, deploying deploying something like this. Uh, so in this talk, I I will focus mostly on the uh, first part, which is like how do we identify sections that are uh, not not written well. So uh, our goal is to create a diagnostic tool that can help uh, either the authors or experts identify such sections. In some sense, we, are, we don't want to replace the authors or experts, but we want to help them with a tool like this. So the way we proceed is we uh, have a uh, uh, probabilistic model. And after uh, experimenting with different possible uh, variables, we uh, narrowed down on two classes of variables, which we call dispersion and uh, syntactic complexity. Uh, further, we uh, notice that it's very hard to obtain uh, high quality judgments uh, for learning the parameters. So we also show a way to automatically generate the training data for uh, this setting. So, so as I mentioned, uh, we have the model where uh, the, the output is one of three possibilities, augment or uh, don't augment, it's already written well. Or the third possibility is that uh, we are not sure. So it perhaps needs further examination by uh, an expert. A and there are uh, the two classes of the uh, variables. And I will then finally describe how we generate the uh, training data. So first, uh, the variables. So the, by looking at many uh, such textbooks, we uh, derive this intuition that um, if you look at some textbook that is written well, uh, the the concepts in this in such a section are uh, all interrelated. So, for example, this is a, a section from a physics textbook on electric generators, and you can notice that all the concepts are highly uh, closely related. So, by contrast, so here is a, a section from a, a social science textbook, and you, you can notice that. Many of these, con some of these concepts are related, like Adam Smith and economy and so forth. But some, like caste system to forest produce to uh, uh, Adam Smith, they're like highly disconnected concepts. Can you explain what related means? What it takes to get an arrow? Uh, so I, I'll get into that shortly. So, so intuitively, uh, what I mean is that intuitively, we we in the previous example, we believe that all these concepts are interrelated, 
like they are uh, it's intuitively we think that they are related like electricity or electric current and so forth whereas in in this uh, example the some of the concepts like the uh, forest produce or caste system they are intuitively we feel they are not related yeah, so the challenge is so so uh, we are saying uh, in the real world like whether the concepts are related so so basically the challenge is now how do we uh, formalize this intuition so how do we uh, for one how do we define uh, the uh, identify the concepts in a textbook and then once identified how do we obtain the relationships between concepts um, so so suppose that we are given the set of concepts uh, in a section and similarly a yeah, relationship uh, function uh, that tells whether two concepts are related or not then uh, we can define a notion of uh, dispersion to be the fraction of concepts that are not related to each other so the intuition is that if a uh, text has a large dispersion so there is a greater need for uh, augmenting such textbook because it gets harder to understand Uh, so, it, so actually, uh, yeah, the, uh, we, are, we are thinking that it's uh, asymmetric. So the so the reason is the following. So uh, quite often, a very specialized concept you can think of it as related to a general concept, but it may not hold the other way around. So for for instance, uh, so say this workshop on uh, if you take this workshop on algorithms in the field, so there is a strong relation to say Rutgers because that's is held in Dimax, and Dimax is part of, part of Rutgers. But when you think of Rutgers as an university, this may not be the first thing that comes to mind. So, so in that sense, the relationship can be asymmetric. Uh, so the way, uh, so as you can see, so once you have a uh, graph on concepts, we can define this as essentially the uh, one minus the edge density in this graph. So the next question is, how do we get uh, this relationship? So in fact, it's it's both. Uh, it, there can be any way of getting this graph. The way we get is uh, both, like making use of the textbook as well as outside knowledge. Uh, so in the, the, uh, in the real world, it's not intended to be textbook. It's fail <coughs> somehow, but the uh, <coughs> it's intended to be a representation of the real world. Uh, yes. So the the concept relationship, at least the way we define it, is. Uh, capturing the the relationship in the real world so of course ideally this can be uh, conditioned on maybe all the educational materials and so forth but, but uh, so currently we are considering in the entire uh, the real world so the way uh, we uh, we observe that many of the concepts in uh, technical concepts in textbooks typically correspond to what are known as terminological noun phrases so these are patterns of the form, uh, it's a sequence of adjectives followed by a sequence of uh, nouns. So, so for example, uh, in the in this sentence, we would identify uh, phrases like Mahatma Gandhi or important ideas, freedom struggle, and so forth. Uh, we also further uh, this is the candidate set of concepts that we uh, identify first. We define it with uh, other sources, ortho slightly orthogonal sources like WordNet or the probability of occurrence of these phrases on the web, but I won't uh, go into those details in this talk. Uh, so once we identify the concepts, uh, we map these concepts to Wikipedia articles and use the linkage structure in Wikipedia articles to get the relationship. So the, the in intuition is that um, we, the, the, the linkage structure in Wikipedia is very rich. So, so if two concepts are related, there is a very high chance that there will be a uh, there will be a pointer from one concept to the other concept. So, so this is the first class of variables. Uh, so the second uh, class is uh, what we call the syntactic complexity. So the first thought that came to our mind was to use uh, the readability formulas because there has been a lot of research uh, into uh, obtaining the readability formulas to capture the complexity <coughs> of writing. Uh, but when we studied this, we noticed that they, they have been uh, obtained, the, the weights have been learned on specific corpuses, um, and it was not clear whether those corpuses will apply to 
the setting that we are interested in, the setting of textbooks. And further, it was not clear which of these uh, different uh, formulas to use. So instead, we uh, noticed that all these formulas have two underlying uh, variables, underlying factors. So one is a measure of the complexity of the sentences, such as the average words per sentence. The other is the measure of uh, how complex are the words, such as the average number of syllables per word. So the intuition, again, is that if a section has, if a text has large syntactic complexity, then it gets harder to understand, especially at, when we think of the high school level. So given uh, these two, so the next uh, question is how do we combine this? So that's the reason we want to generate the training data. And uh, let me say that uh, since we want to learn the relative importance of these concepts, we use a standard uh, binary logistic regression. And once we get the uh, probabilities from this uh, regression, we, uh, we want to uh, discretize them because we don't want to uh, give too much importance to the actual probabilities because there is uh, this is on real data and there are the different sources of errors. So we we quantize them based on uh, the distribution of these probabilities. So so from this quantization we get uh, whether to enrich a section or not enrich a section or for the values in between we say that we, we are not sure. Um, so, so the next part is how to generate the training data automatically. Um, so the, the intuition is that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, it's very difficult to get a high quality uh, label set. It's very, it has been noticed that uh, when we uh, get human judgments, uh, it's very hard to get consistency across judges, and in a, especially in a uh, setting like this where uh, it's not a very easy task of judging whether a, a section spanning perhaps many pages is easy to understand or not. It's very hard to get a good quality human judgments. Um, Sorry, to clarify, I, I guess the heading algorithmically generated training set. I don't understand what that's addressing. So this is, what, what is the problem that's... So the problem is that we have uh, the, a few variables. So we want to learn how much weight to assign to these variables. So we need some uh, training set for uh, computing this, learning this weight. Uh, so, so the uh, point is that one one approach to get this training set could be uh, we give different sections to human judges and ask them to label whether these sections are good or these sections are bad and so forth. Uh, but th that's it's hard to do that because of uh, many reasons. Like it's hard to get consistency across judges. It's, can you show us what variables are, what intuition there is, and why that mysterious formula is what you came up with? Uh, he said, so rather than go on now, maybe go back to the previous slide. And so so what I are these variables, z and w, and two? Yeah, right. So no, I didn't, that formula? I didn't get, uh, go into the exact formula. So we are, we are no, this is the, uh, th this, uh, uh, what is known as the logistic uh, function. So so basically, the, the intuition is that, uh, so we have, so the variables are, the denoted by the vector z, and w is the set of weights. And in the standard logistic regression, so we, we first take a linear combination of these two, and then take the uh, w what is called the logit uh, function of the uh, linear combination. What is b? So b is a uh, b is a uh, so intercept. You could think of it as intercept. Uh, intercept. Intercept. Yeah. Intercept. Intercept. But you say this is a standard formula used somewhere? Yeah, yes, it's, it's the, it is, uh, this is called the logistic regression. <coughs> What's it used for typically? So it's used in many machine learning contexts. It's, it's, uh, it's just like, say, uh, using a decision tree. So this is another way to combine uh, variables when the variables are numeric. It's probably why it was one. What is why? Uh, so, so why is the probability that uh, a section, the y denotes the variable that a section needs enrichment. And Z is zero wonder. Okay, and, Z, and roughly speaking, Z and W, Z is just, what is the size of Z? How many 
So, uh, so in our case, Z is just uh, three variables because we are using uh, dispersion and we are using the two variables for uh, the synthetic complexity. So typically, the in a, a machine learning uh, problem, the Z can have many variables depending on the many uh, factors involved. Uh, no, the, each of these variables are uh, numeric, so they're, they're not binary. Right? Uh, and then uh, for in, in logistic regression, so typically the way these weights are learned is by um, maximizing the conditional log likelihood of uh, this function. So, so, so let, uh, I won't go into the details because this, but this but the. Just if you're good, tell us a lot about finding these values. You just say with the intuition of the three values in Z, what are they intuitively? Uh, so the the three variables are what I described here. So the uh, dispersion is one of the variables. Which dispersion? So dispersion is what we define as the. Uh, okay. So so this is the dispersion. So given the concepts in the section, it's essentially the fraction of the concept pairs that are not related to each other. Okay. So uh, and this, the other two variables are essentially the uh, th these two. The the average sentence length in the section and average word length in the section. Okay. Can you tell us why, why, what is, why average word length? Does that give you a hint about complexity or something? Why, in oh. sense, like, why is that relevant? So, so basically the intuition is that if, uh, if a section has very long sentences, uh, then it, it's harder to parse. And especially like given that these are school textbooks, uh, it's harder to parse and understand from a reader's perspective. It's got a lot of words, it's hard to understand. Uh, so similarly, it, uh, in the re uh, readability literature, people have uh, noticed that if, if there are uh, long words, like typically multi-syllable words, then it gets harder to understand. Um, so, so I was describing uh, why we want to generate the training data automatically. Uh, so the, the intuition is that, suppose we had uh, many revisions of a textbook and we look at the same section across these revisions and if the section has remained uh, roughly the same across revisions uh, it's an indication that the section was good to start with on the other hand if the section was edited again and again across revisions then uh, it's an indication that uh, perhaps at the beginning the, the the quality of the text was not very good so this is what we call as the immaturity it's a measure of the change on a, for a section across uh, in subsequent revisions. Is it change between editions of the same textbook, like edition one, edition two? Uh, uh, yes, so you could intuitively think of, uh, say, if you had m m uh, many editions of a uh, same textbook, then to what extent has a given section changed across uh, sections? If it's changed a lot, that's good or bad? So if it's changed a lot, uh, in uh, at the beginning, it was not good. So the, that's the- The original was not good. Uh, yes. It became good. Uh, right. So, yeah, yes. Sorry, um, I know you're already getting so many questions. But, uh, so I don't really buy that measure because textbooks are often written by multiple authors. It could just be that author A is just never revising the sections, whereas author B is very conscientious making a good section even better. Oh, so I think yeah, I think that's uh, uh, in yeah in in uh, say that, that's a good point. So whether. Uh, so ideally, we, we want to weigh by authors. We want to maybe restrict to sections that are written by the same author and so forth. But I think that's a, we, we are not really uh, addressing that. So let me let me explain how we uh, approximate that because we, I, unfortunately in our setting we don't even have uh, revisions of textbook. So so instead, um, what, what we do is uh, we we map these textbooks to. Uh, a version document repository, so in our case, uh, a Wikipedia. And the intuition is that, uh, yes, a repository like Wikipedia has many versions of the same article. So if we can map a textbook section to you know, the most similar version of an article in Wikipedia, then we can uh, compute the immaturity of the article in Wikipedia and use that to uh, approximately infer the immaturity of the section. And again, this is uh, uh, this, there is a lot of approximation going on here because uh, we cannot map a textbook section exactly to 
uh, any version of a Wikipedia article. Uh, and uh, so the, me the measure computed this way is go uh, going to be approximate. And so, so what we are interested in is we, we don't, uh, we are interested in, in only the extremes, only when, uh, the first of all, the ma mapping quality is good. And second, only when the, uh, we conclude that the immaturity scores are either very high or very low. So we're not really interested in the in-between setting. So the Wikipedia article changes a lot. That's a bad sign for the textbook. So, so that's the uh, if you if you have mapped uh, a section to uh, the closest Wikipedia uh, article version, and if that version has subsequently been uh, edited a lot, then it's an indication that uh, to start with, it was not very good. I don't get it. I mean, here's a very well written textbook. Here's a very poorly written textbook. They both map the same Wikipedia article in the section, and because the Wikipedia article has changed, you're going to penalize both. The good uh, textbook and the bad textbook, they're bad because they put this, this Wikipedia article that's changed a lot. I don't get so, why so, uh, they can do it together. Uh, no, it's, if the quality of the mapping is very good, then... Uh, What's the quality of the mapping? Mean? You're mapping, this is, this is a section about the Revolutionary War of mm -hmm. the United States. And they, it says a Wikipedia article about it. It's changed a lot. So therefore you're saying the textbook was bad because the Wikipedia article changed a lot? Is that what you're saying? So it, not the Wikipedia article, but a specific version of the article. So if, let's say, uh, there are suppose two textbooks discussing revolutionary war, and in one case the article was, was well written, was coherent, and in uh, the textbook, or in, in the, the in the textbook. Yes. So then the the uh, the hope is that it will map to a, a version of the revolutionary war article which is uh, which has been developed well. So on the other hand, if the uh, if you consider the textbook where the article was that the Revolutionary War uh, section was not written well, so it will map to uh, a poorer version of the corresponding Wikipedia article. So the Wikipedia article has evolved over uh, many versions, and um, if the section did not have a good description of uh, this concept, the Revolutionary War, so the premise is that it will map to perhaps an early version of the uh, Wikipedia article, and uh, that has high immaturity. Oh, okay. Uh, so let me uh, right. Uh, so so the first uh, problem is how do we map uh, sections to Wikipedia article versions, and we use uh, sketches that have been discussed again and again in this uh, workshop. Um, so specifically, we use sketches based on uh, minimize independent permutations uh, to to uh, estimate uh, 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 the Jacquard similarity. So once. Uh, we have uh, so once, suppose we have mapped the textbooks to Wikipedia article versions, and now the question is how do we compute the immaturity scores uh, for multiple versions of a document? So, so the intuition is that uh, a, a mature document is likely to remain the same, uh, or does not have many edits in its size. Uh, whereas, and similarly, like the uh, the edits that are present are. Uh, relatively, uh, compared to the size of the article, they're li likely to be less in size. So the relative size of the edits is likely to be small. On the other hand, if there are uh, frequent edits of a document, and even the size of the edits is relatively large compared to the original uh, document size, it's an indication that uh, the article was uh, has high uh, immaturity. So to quantify this, we uh, we define immaturity as a function of the relative edits on each day uh, and within a time window, so that uh, we are looking at only edits uh, within a, a window of a short time window around the document. And we want to give more weight to more recent edits. Uh, so the way we uh, do this is we, we look at a vector of the relative uh, changes in document size across uh, this window of uh, k days. And we convolve it with a smoothing filter like filter so that it gives more weights to more recent edits. So once uh, this is how we get the immaturity of uh, the Wikipedia, Wikipedia article versions. And then, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, we, we are only interested in very few <coughs> labels, because there are just three <coughs> parameters and, and three uh, weights to be learned. Uh, and further, because of a lot of approximation going on in this process, uh, the immaturity computation is reliable only at the extreme ends. 
So that is when the immaturity computer is very high and when it's computed, when the immaturity computer is very low. So we, we, we want, uh, hence we ignore all the values in between. So we look at only those sections which have mapped to uh, article versions with very high immaturity and say that these sections uh, are uh, need enrichment. And similarly, we look at the other end, the, the sections that map to article versions with very low immaturity and say that these sections don't need enrichment. Uh, so, so, this is, so I have described the, the training set generation as well as the variables. So let me quickly uh, mention um, the, how the, uh, the application on a class of textbooks. So we applied this to a corpus of high school textbooks from India. And these are textbooks spanning four different grades and variety of subjects from sciences to commerce and so forth. And these are textbooks followed, uh, these are textbooks published by a central board of education in India and they're followed by millions of students in the country. So here is an example of uh, a section that we conclude it needs enrichment. And um, so as you can see, the, there are many unrelated concepts in this section, so uh, resulting in high discussion. So concepts like functional areas, or, yeah, a common seal is not as related to our Hindu joint family. These are not very well related. And further, this uh, section is full of uh, long sentences and a uh, lot of complex words, which makes uh, parsing and understanding harder. Uh, so on the other hand, so here is an example of a section that we detect to not read enrichment. And these are sections which are typically clearly written, uh, easy to, short sentences, easy to understand. And even the concepts discussed in this section are highly interrelated. So uh, let me conclude by saying that, uh, so we have just scratched uh, the, the tip of the problem. And uh, there are th this uh, area of like augmenting textbooks or in general augmenting improving uh, education, I think is a very interesting area. And uh, we, have just, we have shown that there is a possibility for uh, te technological approaches to uh, play a role in this space. Uh, yes, uh, we are in the in the paper we have like uh, we show articles uh, we, we show sections uh, even from say science or uh, uh, like physics or uh, math sections that that are poorly written and yeah, when we went and looked at those sections we noticed that again the uh, the section probably discussed too many concepts uh, so it, it was like overloaded with many concepts. Uh, so I think I think that's the that's the next step. So we want to so we want to, uh, so one of the challenges is like uh, uh, devising an evaluation methodology, and then ideally like we want to uh, do some kind of control study where uh, maybe uh, students following these textbooks will get uh, we will have two groups of students like a, a control group and a group which gets access to um, such augmented materials, and then we we can we want to measure whether. Um, yeah, but say some standardized scores of the students change uh, given the origin, <coughs> given uh, in the control group versus the group where we provide uh, such augmentations. Yeah. So a related question is the other source of data for your decision is what the students think is easy to read or not. Yeah, yes. Uh, yes, so I think, uh, yes, that's a great point. So we have uh, thought about that, like, I, if we have access to, say, test scores, uh, um, or, uh, right, right, right. So uh, unfortunately, in this uh, corpus, we didn't have access to other data. But I think if we have uh, data sets of that kind, like, uh, for uh, exercises in different uh, sections, what are the 
uh, response of students and how which sections did students find difficult and so forth. I think that'll be really interesting. Now, why do you only attack the sections that are badly written? Maybe people want enrichment in every section. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, in fact, uh, in, yeah, at least historically, that's how we started off. We we uh, uh, first uh, worked on the problem of identifying sec concepts in every section and then augmenting with links to articles and images. Uh, but then we noticed this, uh, we noticed that uh, that from the perspective of if you are targeting this for say students, then it, it may uh, impose too much burden on the students, too much cognitive burden on the students. So we don't want to uh, uh, augment, we don't want to uh, overload the students or the teachers with too much information. So so that's the reason we we uh, we don't want to do this augmentation when the section is already well written. Uh, so Wikipedia is just one uh, source of information. So in, in fact, the techniques that we have are agnostic to, say, the choice of Wikipedia. So instead of Wikipedia, if we had a better uh, corpus uh, where uh, it was maybe pro more professionally written and uh, it still had uh, rich uh, metadata like linkage between articles and so forth, I think that should equally work. Did you ever run your stuff on Wikipedia to see which ones were the bad articles? Uh, oh, so you mean on the, yes, I think that that's uh, in fact a, a great point. So I had that as one of the uh, directions. So if applying techniques like immaturity or dispersion on Wikipedia articles themselves. So so we can use this, uh, for, for instance, if a Wikipedia article has very high dispersion, then uh, perhaps it's an indication that the article should be split into two or more. So it's discussing too many concepts. Two more questions. Hiring an expert to evaluate it might be a more efficient way to, to do this. Yeah, uh, so I think I think that's an interesting point. So it, it relates to the broader question of uh, what is the role of uh, automation in this. So why not uh, just get the experts to judge which uh, sections are good and which sections are bad. Uh, so so I think there are a couple of directions. So one one question is that uh, in fact the the textbooks themselves are written by uh, so-called experts, and in spite of the textbooks being written by the subject experts in the field, the, uh, there's still a wide variation in the quality of different sections within the same textbook. And the other uh, aspect is that, uh, in some sense, what we are doing is just uh, diagnostic tool. We are not uh, saying that there should not be experts in the picture. Uh, we, are, we are just, imagine an author trying to revise the textbook, then uh, this could be a tool to suggest which sections uh, need um, more attention compared to which sections are needing lesser attention. Last question. Uh, yes, it's just a, uh, yeah, so it can be anything. So, so I meant algorithmic as opposed to uh, say something like human judgment where, uh, so, so I meant algorithmic only to indicate that it's an automated approach. I didn't think that was the reason. Well, good comment. Do, do you think that, uh, well, there are a lot of difficult challenges. Do you think that you have a reasonable starting point to, say, get really bad ones or really automatically, you know, bots writing books or, or uh, really hard to do Can you just do it in a very quick uh, scan, get these things identified easily, rather than try to, try to get very nuanced pieces of a book that some pieces are well written, some pieces are bad written, and try to get, resolve these cases? So you mean um, looking at the book as a whole? Uh, I mean, uh, so you know, apply the 80-20 rule, so you know, things that are very bad, get them the first shot. Do you think it would be useful as a tool for so, so I think, uh, uh, in some sense, that's kind of what we're doing. So we, are, we don't want to make this prediction for every section, because uh, we cannot do that, given the lot of uh, approximation in the process. So uh, instead, what we are doing is we are only uh, predicting, making these predictions when we are really sure, when we think that the section is really uh, very badly written, or when the section is uh, already in good shape. So we, we don't make any prediction for the uh, sections in between. Cool. Can we take this? Sure. You consider crowdsourcing to, to identify so, uh, I think uh, that's a great point. So, in in some sense, the uh, crowdsourcing approaches are complementary to all of this. Like, 
uh, to ident either identify bad sections or suppose this can be a uh, bootstrapping point. So we can so some some techniques like this can be used to uh, bootstrap a crowdsource system. So in fact, originally we wanted to look at some kind of uh, collaborative platform for creating or sharing educational content, and then we realized that uh, we need something to bootstrap uh, such a system. Thank you.